This is the Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie, episode 24. What's the deal with gluten sensitivity? Hey everyone in podcast land, thank you for joining me again. This is the Regain Wellness Podcast. This is episode 24, two dozen also, my number in hockey for anyone who cares or has been keeping track of stuff like that. So RegainWellness.com is a website that I run that is set up to help you take back your health, to provide you with every nutrition issue you can possibly think of and a lot that you might not even have thought of and how all those can affect your health and how everything works together to create this whole sense of wellness. So everything from your diet specific issues on what we're talking about today, like say the gluten wheat issue to whether you need fats, what kind of fats are carbs dangerous, which carbs are the best, which are the worst, what's the deals with sugar, cover everything on that. So if you head to regainwellness.com, you'll see all the back articles I have, blogs, everything's listed in there and categories, all the podcasts as well. Like I said, we got 24 of these here now. So there's a lot of stuff you can go back and see. So if you're listening on a fancy phone or device or whatever, and it does have access to iTunes, if you could head on over and leave me a review and rating there, it really helps the show get bumped up and more people will be able to be helped by it. So we've been up and down in the top 10 within still in the new and noteworthy section for fitness and nutrition in the health category. So it's still pretty prevalent and people are being more and more aware of the show. But the more, we're not sure how iTunes exactly works, but it looks like with ratings and reviews and subscribing that it's exposed to more people and the more people we expose this to, the more we can help. So I appreciate you for listening right now. Get uh, anyone else you know on board and help them start getting healthy too. The more information you have, the better decisions you can make in any nutrition situation. And that's kind of my goal with this whole thing here is just to help equip you and arm you with all the knowledge. So when you're standing in an aisle in the grocery store looking at all these thousands of products, not sure, not sure where to start, hopefully I will equip you with enough re, uh, information that you can draw on to help make the best nutrition decisions. Or if it's you're at a work function dinner and you're not sure what's up on the menu, what's, you know, if you're trying to be healthy and trying to be well, you don't know what to avoid. Listening to this and reading everything I provide will help you in those situations specifically to make the best choices possible. So that's the whole goal with everything we're doing here. And today we're talking about something that a lot of people might be sick of hearing about. And I've covered it a bit before, and it's the whole gluten issue. And yeah, like you might be sick of hearing it. It's like, it feels like certain buzzwords like selfie, which you might just be appalled at when you hear now. And I covered it, the whole gluten topic in another podcast, which I'll link in the show notes, which will be regainwellness.com slash 024. And in that episode, it's more of a breakdown on what the deal is with wheat and gluten and how it's like wheat specifically has changed over the centuries and what it's become, how it's evolved into a, a plant almost, uh, you know, you can't even really call it necessarily a plant, but a, a creation that is not as recognizable by our body anymore and how the enhanced gluten in the wheat has caused this like explosion in celiac disease and the rates have gone up just in the last 50, 60 years. So it's a, it's a lot more in-depth discussion on that whole issue. Today we're talking more about the idea of gluten sensitivity. And a lot of people are just, you know, jumping on that gluten sensitivity bandwagon and might not even know why exactly they're doing it. So I just want to give a little information here on what the whole issue has been. And... The quick summary from the other podcast, I do encourage you to go to listen to that. The quick summary is that gluten itself is simply just a sticky protein. And the word gluten comes from the Latin word, which means glue. And it's a sticky protein found in the seeds of grass. And we call these seeds grains. 
and they make up a huge part of our diet. The World Health Organization actually says that wheat alone makes up 20% of the average diet. And it probably makes up at least that in your diet or maybe more. I know mine used to have large, large amounts of wheat from breakfast cereals to breads throughout the day, sandwiches to tons of pastas, whether it's mac and cheese or spaghetti or anything. That was the first dish I ever mastered was spaghetti. And it's always one of those go-tos when you're never sure what to do. But I'm sure like me, wheat makes quite a lot of appearances in your diet. So it's been around for quite a while and has been a staple of mankind since we really become mankind. And the when we evolved from more of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle into a farming, agriculture, grain-domesticating people, it's when a lot of our society changed and our civilization changed. And the formation of societies was because of agriculture and farming and wheat and these areas had to be developed and different tribes would form and they you know consider that a rise of a lot of the spreading of a lot of diseases that occurred was because now people were living more in closer proximity because their lives revolved around this new agriculture and gluten's not just in wheat which is what we primarily focus on here, but it's in, you know, barley, rice. It's even in things like rye and corn and stuff like that. The gluten concentration in grains is really the main concern here, and especially wheat, again, like I said, because it's the most available, it's the most readily consumed form of gluten. So it's really the the focus here. So what's causing all these problems now when we've been eating wheat for thousands of years and like the wheat of the Bible and why are all these issues coming up with celiac disease and autoimmunity and things like that? Well, the wheat of the Bible or even a few hundred years ago is vastly different than the wheat we're consuming today, which is a modern hybridized and genetically altered form of wheat. It's honestly an entirely different plant and this might explain why the rates of celiac disease, like I mentioned before, have risen fourfold in the last 50 to 60 years and have doubled in the last 20 years. So if you don't have time to go back to the other podcast, the quick summary of wheat with how it's changed is when wheat as in its primitive form was called einkorn, which was a very simple plant, kind of like a, a straggly grass, which remember is what grains are like they're the seeds of grasses and they were left over from the ice age so when the you know glacier periods when they were retreating they're kind of dragging and digging up the earth and they would leave behind some vegetation that would grow and einkorn was one of these plants so a very simple um lower chromosome plant which was around i think 12 or 14 the wheat of the bible is called emmer wheat which has advanced a little more. It's now the double amount of chromosomes, but still relatively simple. And so it does not have these higher concentrations of gluten and other, other things we'll get to later. The wheat we have today has been more of a genetically altered form that was really investigated in the late 50s and 60s by a guy named Dr. Norman Borlaug. And he was a geneticist who was looking at the issue of the population explosion all over the world and how are all these people going to be fed. So the noble intention was to research creating new forms of plants that would have a higher yield. And that's what they did with wheat is through a lot of technical terms, like things called like back crossing and genetic mutations and everything like that, they were able to create a plant that had a higher yield and they made it even it became a, a smaller type plant. When you think of wheat, you think of the the whole amber waves of grain and all that, and tall wheat is you know higher than your head. But wheat now with these kind of created versions, they call it the semi dwarf variant, and it's only two, maybe two and a half feet high. It's not what it used to be, and they've had to actually engineer the the stalks thicker to keep up the larger seed head that's on top of it which it never used to be like. And it, it was originally where, say, farmers were growing 
you know, eight bushels an acre with these new forms of this semi-dwarf variant of wheat, they are now able to grow 80 bushels per acre. So if you're a farmer and you're growing these simple forms, whatever, and you're looking across the other field and seeing them growing that much more, making that much more money, obviously you'd want to jump on board with that. And again, this is that noble intention idea that they were creating a larger quantity of foods and plants that were able to help feed this growing population around the world. So when we're talking about the issue of gluten sensitivity, there are some new studies in the last few months or whatever it came up that said that sensitive sensitivity to gluten might not be a real thing as subjects who were administered gluten through double blind trials did not suffer from the effects of, um, they were looking at people who had irritable bowel syndrome, which can be one of those effects that comes from autoimmunity and, and exposure to gluten over too long a period. So they found that they were not suffering the effects of their irritable, irritable bowel syndrome like they had expected. So this was enough that everyone was, oh, gluten sens- sensitivity is a myth from these like you know very limited studies. So people who are not buying into this gluten-free hype, you know, were kind of claiming victory over people who were just you know saying I'm getting on board with this and I'm not sure why. And I think it's just a reason to you know expose people for not being genuine or being fake or you know just doing that bandwagon thing. But there were, however, some troubles with these studies. And first off, to see the real danger of gluten, you have to look really deep into the gut and to see the actual breakdown of the small intestine walls. And this is where the damage of gluten can happen. It can break down within the small intestine. There's a lot of these finger-like projections called villi and microvilli, and they absorb various nutrients and amino acids and they're also to have their own little kind of like a docking station where they receive these things and gluten can break these down. So think of them as kind of like shags on a shag carpet, these villi and microvilli, these little finger like projections. They over time can slowly be broken down by gluten and you're kind of left with a flat subfloor. And then that creates huge problems with digestion and, and absorption and real discomfort and real um, bloating and gas and cramping, which are kind of almost like the mild effects compared to how much this this condition can evolve. So like I said, with these studies, they're just looking at various symptoms when to see the real damage, you have to look at the, that breakdown of the small intestinal walls. And again, this can take decades to show up like the slow breakdown over time. The studies were based around people reporting how they feel, you know, that old, if you're you know, indicating pain threshold, like how do you feel on a, you know, one to 10, what's your pain at seven? This is kind of thing. They were basing the studies on how people said they felt, which a lot of factors can be involved in how they're actually feeling. This can clearly offer some feedback, but does not reveal what's happening, happening internally. Like I said, gluten exposure can lead to inflammation in the body And that's not always going to present itself in the symptoms I mentioned before, like cramps or digestion problems. Inflammation is like a ticking time bomb that then leads to that autoimmunity and a host of diseases. It's essentially when your body is turning on itself. So also with these these studies, probably most concerning is how the test subjects were administered gluten. It was given to them as a purified wheat gluten supplement of 16 grams kind of like a a ground up sort of flour, but only the gluten was extracted out of it. The big big problem here is we don't eat gluten. We eat wheat. We eat rye. We eat barley. We don't eat it in its isolated extracted compound. We eat food. So in failing to administer like full wheat, the study failed to acknowledge the way people consume it on a regular basis. And that's the trouble that can come from it when you're constantly eating this wheat over days and weeks and months. You're never going to sit down and eat 16 grams of just gluten in a little powdered cup. You're going to eat half a pizza or a giant bowl of spaghetti or white bread over the course. So this is the problem with, with studies like this. You have to look a little deeper as opposed to 
media outlets that just pick up on it because it's a hot topic. And anything where you can challenge someone's viewpoint where you have this huge gluten avoidance movement going on and a lot of it is very genuine and let's be honest a lot is people doing the whole bandwagon thing whether you're a new england patriots fan or a seahawks fan or whatever the big thing is at the moment a lot of people just like to jump on board with that and that's probably never going to change so the issue here is now instead of just jumping all over people saying like hey look at your gluten sensitivity is a myth and you have no idea what you're talking about you're just doing the bandwagon thing, you got to look a little closer at studies like this and see they're really not all they're cracked up to be. You know, you don't, when the, when there's a media report, like say on Huffington post or whatever, CNN, where they're just like gluten sensitivity is not a proven thing. They usually don't go that deeper into the study, but like in this situation, look at how it was actually dealt. And that sort of changes the whole approach to it. So they can, you know, like I said, the, the studies are more about creating online traffic by presenting a conclusion that really sparks a debate, which is the whole point of, of, the, of the media. Either side will probably not be convinced no matter what the findings in situations like this. But what's most important, I think, is to continue to do your own research and expose yourself to as many ideas and insights as possible. And that's, like I said at the top of the show, that's what I hope to do with this podcast with the blog, everything at regainwellness.com is to expose you to more ideas, present what's out there, give you a jumping off point, and then hopefully encourage you to keep doing your more research and digging deeper. So say with this, uh, this gluten sensitivity study with the irritable bowel syndrome, you might've taken it just at face value and like, oh, so it's just a bunch of hoo-ha. And if you had maybe look deeper, you would have seen, hmm, this maybe isn't a legitimate test compared to how other real trials and studies are done over years and maybe even decades. So whatever the issue is, don't take it at face value. When you see it, take it kind of with a grain of salt and look a little deeper into it. And if I can help you with that, that's, yeah, that's my job done. And that's basically all I have to say today about the, it's not as much, you know, about the gluten sensitivity. It's about taking Um, research and headlines and and looking beyond them and educating yourself as best as possible this is just a very good example because i think it's relevant and i think it applies so i want to thank you for listening wherever you are driving biking hiking parachuting or wherever your mobile device goes with you i can go with you too and that's just nice and we can spend all this time together so thanks for joining me today um Head over to reganwellness.com. You can check me on Facebook if you're still liking the whole social media thing. I'm on, it's uh, facebook.com slash reganwellness. Twitter, it's a good way to interact. I like to be involved there. I can post a lot of stuff easy. It's more of a real-time back and forth. So that's, the handle is at regain wellness and if you have any questions or if you want to see different stuff covered on the show or things i can answer on the show or whole topics you can write to the email address which is info at regainedwellness.com so again thanks for listening i've um, got some good interviews coming up in the next week or so and in the meantime like i was saying I encourage you to do your own research to keep looking deeper and when you're doing that and also in your progression of your health I like to say the idea is to keep moving forward, knowing it's not always going to be perfect, but keeping that progression idea. So it's the progress and not the perfection is what you want to strive towards. So I'll see you next time. Bye. Did I really say hoo-ha back there? Okay, I might have to edit that out. See you later.